Here's an idea. You define your username, but your username defines you. So wait a minute, what is a name? According to Wittgenstein and Freg, names are just combinations of symbols with some specific referent. So if I say Mike is a wonderful, talented speaker whose words have touched the hearts and minds of millions, I'm referring to this guy. And the entire utility of the word Mike is that it can be used to refer to this guy, or this guy, or this guy, or these guys. There's nothing special about the specific noise that is Mike. He could be called Flirpadoo or Pepper Picking Peter Piper. What matters is that we all kind of agree that this sound refers to this person in this context and leave it at that. Names are traditionally given to you, either by your parents with your legal name or by your peers with nicknames. In Meatspace, your name is largely outside of your control. Sure, you can have it legally changed, but believe me, that's a lot more difficult than whipping up a new screen name. Usernames are different. They're names you provide to a system to control how it refers to you. These systems can be a computer, a social media website, some forum, nearly anything. They can be private, like login information, or corporate, your name at company.org. We are going to be focusing on those that are not either. Unlike given names, usernames, screen names, handles, and so on are chosen by their reference, with a few notable exceptions. Computers do not understand the connotation of a name, they only have access to the characters used to represent it. So they're not going to turn around and tell you that you must pick a name that will make sense or give a good impression to future employers. This means that otherwise bizarre combinations become fair play. You may not want others to know certain things that your legal name gives away. Age, gender, ethnic background, etc. With usernames, you can disclose just as much or as little information as you want. So your name could be the first 15 digits of pi and it would work just as well as pasta lover 33. This ability to selectively disclose information can isolate people from the consequences of their actions. The blessings of anonymity fall on the just and the unjust alike as do the consequences of the actions they take with it. Computer hackers of either hat variety can use usernames, among other things, to avoid seeing jail time for pursuing goals of questionable moral and legal standing. For more innocuous habits, usernames can protect users from local oppressive laws, and celebrities can use them to avoid recognition, either in meat space or online. How do you know that the person you were just arguing with was not beloved character actress Margot Martindale? But of course, people used fake names for the sake of anonymity long before the internet. They just were not called usernames, they were called pseudonyms. Unlike usernames, pseudonyms have been around for thousands of years. From Voltaire to Alice Campion to Beyonce, pseudonyms have many practical and impractical purposes. They can be stage names, part of the fight against oppression, a way to protect your loved ones from supervillains, or just a way to bypass obstructionist company practices in pursuit of the betterment of science. So are pseudonyms and usernames the same, just under different circumstances? Not really. Usernames are particular to our time. Voltaire couldn't convince a chair to call him Voltaire the way that I can convince Siri to call me Awesome McGee. But there are more important distinctions for this discussion. For example, pseudonyms often work around the system, while the systems that require usernames usually make them a necessary feature. Pseudonyms try to emulate real names, while usernames have no such constraint. Pseudonyms are often designed to specifically mislead, while usernames are capable of deceiving as well as being truthful, or just being cognitive noise. If pseudonyms are a tool for controlling information that only some have access to, then every website that features anonymous accounts gives you this tool. The pseudonym is then kind of a proto-username, being to the username what brick phones are to smartphones. That all said, there are some important ways that we use both pseudonyms and usernames equally. Both can be used to divide up responsibility, such as with Pitticus Lore, the collective name of James Frey, Joby Hughes, and Greg Boos while they were writing Lorian Legacies. Or with any account for a collective endeavor, which has been used by countless interns to tweet or publish in the name of the whole. Or perhaps in a better example, we are all anonymous. They can also be used to divide up parts of a single person, such as with authors who might use multiple names depending on which genre they are writing in, or a single user who might divide up their life into 
formal and informal channels using multiple usernames on a single website. There are economic benefits to this as well. If your fantasy book tanks, then that won't spill over into your mathematical textbook sales. There are also psychological effects. Whether to avoid the pressures of being super all the time, or to protect yourself from the consequences of dealing meth to pay for chemo, dividing up your life can provide a measure of control. Many enjoy abusing the artificial dichotomy between online and offline, using only certain accounts to manage offline aspects of their logged on lives. This separation of different pseudonyms for different kinds of work and different usernames for different aspects of life is hardly new. It's no different than how someone might go by Ronald at work, John at the pub, or J.R.R. Tolkien on the dust jacket. These different labels allow us to keep the separate parts of a person, well, separate. They can be worn throughout life, like metaphorical hats, the hat of a student or teacher, parent or child, different roles we occupy that change the way we behave. In this way, our selves are largely contextual. This tells a different story than how chosen names are often represented in TV and film. There are plenty of tangible and intangible consequences of going by a new name or multiple names, but plenty of works paint name changes as the specific actions of someone who is uncomfortable with their true self. Whether they find their given name to be uncool or there is some deeper fear, chosen names are seen as less true than given ones to the point where many superhero identities are actually given. Heroes, especially in older works, do not choose a name to hide behind. The implication is that people only use multiple names to conceal some part of themselves, or to fulfill some wish. But what if the opposite is true? What if using chosen names can actually free you to express some part of yourself. When Jean-Paul Sartre says, hell is other people, he's not saying, oh my god, other people are literally the worst. Instead, it is about how we exist in the minds of others, and indeed cannot escape this if we wish to continue living within society. Others and their gaze impose a hell upon us, and whether it is self-consciousness or feeling trapped into living a life of bad faith, as Sartre would say, other people corner us into these painful positions with their beliefs and ideas about who we are. But with usernames, whether or not something is true with regards to some specific standard, that problem goes away. You have the power on the internet to present exactly as deliberate and curated a version of yourself as you wish for others to see. Perhaps even to create a heaven out of the hell that other people's minds create for you by giving them the information, and only the information, you think matters most to how you want to be seen. The reason usernames are interesting is not because they are weird or ignore social conventions, it's because they are chosen and allow us to define ourselves in the eyes of other people. Previously, this ability has been reserved mostly for the powerful. Popes, kings, emperors, and celebrities have always had this power. Francis I is more than just the name of the Pope. It's part of what being the Pope is. The same way that Your Royal Highness and the Queen are part of the same position. Whether it's the President of the United States or the new actor playing the Doctor, there is more and more pressure for powerful, well-known people to fit the mold of their position. Now, however, the tables have turned. Progressively, choosing your own name is more closely associated with anonymity. This might be a bad thing, as being increasingly surveilled by hordes of people has to be at least somewhat unpleasant, but it might also be a good thing. Whether or not it is good or bad, what famous people lack here is access to the Veil of Ignorance. The Veil of Ignorance being an idea that John Rawls put forward in his 1971 book A Theory of Justice. There's actually an Idea Channel video on it, we'll link to that in the doobly-doo. But for our purposes, what matters is that when designing a society, Rawls says everyone should be ignorant of how that society will specifically treat them. This is important, because the veil of ignorance is about more than just who you are. It's also about where you are. You could theoretically know exactly who you are and still live behind the veil of ignorance, because until the makeup of a society is made perfectly clear to you, you have no idea if your specific race, gender, income, or ability is hindering or helping you based on the society's structural forces. You know, like the internet. 
I'm serious, you don't know when you're scrolling down Reddit if you're the richest or poorest person in an argument. You don't know if the person you're talking to has privileges you do not, or experiences oppressive systems that you don't. People can disclose this information, but they can also lie. After all, in the simulation, no one knew who you really were, unless you wanted them to. This means the closest anyone has ever been to Rawls' proposed original position is randos on the internet. Wealthy celebrities can't be there entirely because no matter what they know they fall on one end of the global bell curve, but random people building communities online is as close a thing to the veil of ignorance as we'll ever get to without, you know, some powerful brainwashing technology. It is interesting then that internet communities are not havens of equality where the bottom rung is still pretty darn good. Rawls' conclusion that the designers would create a society which, while not equal, offers the most advantages to the bottom of the hierarchy relative to other societies, seems to be empirically falsified by 4chan. These great powers that usernames provide us with, anonymity, consequence avoidance, psychological and personal separation of roles, they're the exact tools that we need to create a utopia, but we have not created one yet. Perhaps it's because even without the knowledge of where we sit in the distribution of any given community, our concerns are still chiefly about ourselves, about who we have presented ourselves to be to the world and who we will allow ourselves to become. What do you think? Does your username define you? How do you choose a username and does changing your username change who you are only in the eyes of others, or for yourself as well? Let us know in the comments and we'll get back to some of them in the next comment response video. This video could not have been made possible without these usernames. If you want to get involved in the Open Idea Project, there will be links in the doobly-doo for our Discord, the forum, and other ways that you can contact us and become a part of this amazing group.